Saint Lorenzo Ruiz is a Filipino saint venerated in the Catholic Church. A Chinese Filipino, he became his country's proto-martyr after his execution in Japan by the Tokugawa shogunate during its persecution of Japanese Christians in the 17th century. Lorenzo was born around 1600 in the Binondo district of Manila to a Catholic, Chinese, and Filipino couple. His father taught him Chinese, while his mother taught him Tagalog. The Spaniards ruled over the lands for 333 years, and because of this, Lorenzo spoke three languages, Tagalog, Spanish, and Chinese. He attended a school run by Spanish Dominican friars, as well as serving as an altar boy and a sacristan for the church in his district of Manila. The Dominicans, for their part, taught Lorenzo Spanish, as well as how to read and write. So good was his penmanship that he eventually became a professional calligrapher and a clerk. Inspired by the Dominicans, Lorenzo joined the confraternity of the Holy Rosary. Contemporaries noticed, in a particular way, his honesty and trustworthiness, to the point that the Dominican friars made him their unofficial messenger as well. Lorenzo grew up and married a Filipino woman named Rosario, and with her had three children. He continued to work as a clerk and as a translator for the Spaniards, and their life remained normal. Lorenzo kept his close ties with the Dominicans and helped them in ministering to the people in Manila, especially those in the Binondo district. He led a peaceful and content life. His normal life took a bad turn when he was implicated in the murder of a Spaniard one day. Nothing further is known except the statement of two Dominicans that he was sought by the authorities on account of a homicide to which he was present or which was attributed to him. Ruiz couldn't trust the courts. He knew that much. A lifetime of colonial inequality had taught him that a legal battle between Spaniards and Filipinos under Spanish laws wasn't a legal battle at all. He knew that he couldn't turn to the government for help. He decided to leave his home and seek a safe place to hide for a while. He said goodbye to Rosario and left home in the darkness of night. He confided his problem to Father Domingo Gonzalez, a Dominican priest. The priest was kind towards Lorenzo, and he was allowed to board their ship. Little did Lorenzo know that they were part of a secret missionary to Japan. Lorenzo was under the impression that they were headed to Macau. He was quite surprised when they told him that they were headed to Japan. The three Dominican priests were Saint Antonio Gonzalez, Saint Guillermo Cortet, and Saint Miguel de Azora and Saint Miguel de Azoraza. There was a Japanese priest present named Saint Vicente Shiwazuka de la Cruz, and also a lay leper, Saint Lazaro of Kyoto. All of them sailed for Okinawa on June 10, 1636. As soon as the group landed in Japan, they were arrested. A violent persecution against Christians was being enforced by Emperor Tokugawa Yamitsu to prevent the spread of Christianity in Japan. The missionaries were arrested and thrown into prison, and after two years, they were transferred to Nagasaki to face trial by torture. The group endured many and various cruel methods of torture. Back in Manila, Rosario never heard a word from Lorenzo, and no one knew what had become of him. Once the group of missionaries reached Nagasaki, they were to face trials and torture for being a Christian. The emperor gave them an offer. They could leave Japan 
as long as they were willing to renounce their faith. The missionaries agreed to leave Japan, but they said they will never renounce their faith. This made the shogun lord extremely furious, for none has ever refused the shogunate before. Unaccustomed to rejection, the shoguns considered the group's decision as an insult to their empire and immediately sent the prisoners to their slow and painful execution. While they were put back in the jail, they witnessed the tortures other prisoners had to endure for not obeying the emperor. The prisoners were forced to drink inhuman amounts of water. They were stabbed, pressed, soaked, and repeatedly crushed. Their captors emphasized that the torture would stop if they renounced their faith. When Lorenzo saw this, he got terrified for a moment. It was just a moment when he fell into a spiritual darkness. He quickly prayed the rosary and found relief and had more courage than before. He even started comforting his companions in jail, asking them to have faith in the Lord's grand plan. That night, he prayed the rosary as often as he could. Then came the day of execution. The missionaries were subjected to water torture first. Despite the painful torture, the men refused to renounce their faith. Following this, the soldiers hung the missionaries upside down over a large pit. One among the soldiers took pity on Lorenzo and persuaded him to renounce his faith to end his agony. Lorenzo answered, This I will never do, because I am a Christian, and I shall die for God, and for him I would give many thousands of lives if I had them. And so, do with me as you please. Lorenzo died from bleeding and suffocation, and so did the other missionaries. Saint Lorenzo Ruiz died as he lived, a servant of the Lord. There are countless miracles attributed to Saint Lorenzo Ruiz. The one that stands out the most was the story of Cecilia Allegria Policarpio, a two-year-old girl suffering from a rare brain disease. One night, as her family and supporters prayed to Ruiz for his intercession, the saint appeared to her in a vision. In her recollection, Cecilia said she was lying on her bed, unable to move from the pain when she noticed a light. She remembered seeing a man holding a rosary looking up to the heavens. The following morning, her illness was completely gone. She was able to sit on the bed by herself for the first time in her life. Lorenzo was beatified by Pope John Paul II on February 18, 1981. The beatification ceremony was held in the Philippines, making it the first beatification ceremony ever held outside the Vatican. His canonization took place at the Vatican on October 18, 1987. Saint Lorenzo Ruiz is the patron saint of Filipino youth, the Philippines, people working overseas, and altar servers. Saint Martin de Porres was born in Lima, Peru on December 9, 1519, to Don Juan de Porres, a Spanish nobleman and adventurer, and Ana Velazquez, a freed daughter of slaves from Panama. Ana was probably black, but it is also possible that she belonged to the indigenous people Lima. Martin had a younger sister named Juana as well. Martin inherited the features and dark complexion of his mother. That irked his father, and he abandoned the family when Martin was very young. 
He was raised by his mother in extreme poverty as she worked in a laundry. Stories of Martin's remarkable generosity apparently began to surround him even in childhood. Even as a child, Martin would give the family's scarce resources to the beggars, whom he saw as less fortunate than himself. By the time he was 10, he was spending several hours each day in prayer, a practice he maintained for the rest of his life. He once asked his landlady for the stumps of some candles she had discarded. She later saw him using their meager light to behold a crucifix, before which he knelt, weeping. Perhaps as a result of the boy's spiritual character, Don Juan de Porres acknowledged that he was Martin's father, a remarkable admission at the time. At the age of 12, Martin began an apprenticeship with a barber named Marcel de Rivero. A barber's work during the 16th century involved more than just cutting hair. It involved administering medicines, dressing wounds, and drawing blood. He proved extremely skillful at this trade, and soon customers, who at first were skeptical of the young colored boy, came to prefer and ask for him. As Martin grew older, he experienced a great deal of ridicule for being of mixed race. At 15, Martin decided to devote himself to the religious life. He applied to join the Covenant of the Rosary in Lima, a Dominican ministry. Racial restrictions during the time did not allow colored people to become members of religious order. Instead, he was offered the position of lay helper, which he happily accepted. Martin was allowed to wear the habit and live within the religious community. His medical skills proved useful, and he was put in charge of the monastery infirmary. He was also given the monastery's basic chores, such as cleaning, cooking, and doing the laundry. His relationship with his brothers was tinged by their curiosity and occasional pranks. Sometimes, just before the meal was to be served, the brothers would hide the potholders. Martin would search for it everywhere, and since it was mealtime, he would have to lift the scalding pots with his bare hands. Yet, never once did his fingers get burned. There are numerous incidents that portrayed his self-denial. A monk approached him and asked whether he might not prefer the life at the splendid offices of church elsewhere. Martin responded, quoting Psalm 83, I have chosen to be an abject in the house of my God rather than to dwell in the tabernacle of sinners. He remarked that he was not referring to the people in high offices as sinners, but rather simply that he himself preferred menial tasks. Martin often challenged his brothers on their racial attitudes. In one story, Martin saw an Indian sweeping the floor under the watchful eye of one of the Dominican brothers. When told that they were cleaning to repay a meal they had received, Martin pointed out that the brother had fed some white people the previous day without forcing them to clean. After Martin's firm but gentle challenge, the brother took up the broom himself. He always wore robes until they fell apart, refusing the luxury of new ones. The report of Martin's skill as a surgeon and healer soon spread abroad. As much by his prayers as through medical knowledge, he cured the most frightening diseases, bringing from near death a priest who had a badly infected leg and healing the fingers of a young student. Great as his healing faculty was, Martin is probably best remembered for the legend of the rats. It is told that the prior who objected to rats ordered Martin to set out poison for them. Martin did as he was told, but he was very sorry for the rats. 
he went out into the garden and called softly, and out came the rats. He reprimanded them for their bad habits, telling them about the poison. He further assured them that he would feed them every day in the garden if they would refrain from annoying the prior. This agreed upon, he dismissed the rats, and forever after, so the stories go, there was no more trouble with rats. In addition to the gift of healing, he was endowed with that of bilocation. He was seen in Mexico and Japan by people who knew him well, whereas he had never been out of Lima since entering the order. He passed through locked doors by some means that was known only to himself and God. He appeared at the bedside of sufferers without being asked and always soothed the sick, even when he did not completely cure them. Even sick animals came to him for healing. He would apply his medical skills to the treatment of a wounded dog found wandering the streets with the same energy he would devote to a sick human. Ten years later, after he had been presented with the religious habit of a lay brother, Martin was assigned to the infirmary, where he would remain in charge until his death. Martin's spiritual practices were legendary. He would often fast for extensive periods of time on bread and water. He loved all-night vigils, frequently praying by laying down as if crucified, sometimes kneeling, but miraculously a foot or more off the floor. However, it is St. Martin's charity that made him the patron saint of social justice. Martin fed, sheltered, and doctored hundreds of families. He also provided the requisite dowry to enable a poor young woman to marry. Last but not least, he established the orphanage and school of the Holy Cross, which took in boys and girls of all classes and taught them trades or homemaking skills. He died surrounded by his brothers and reciting the credo, his life ending with the words, et homo factus est. St. Martin died on November 3, 1639. By the time he died, he was widely known and accepted. Talks of his miracles in medicine and caring for the sick were everywhere. After his death, the miracles received when he was invoked in such greatness that when he was exhumed 25 years later, his body exhaled a splendid fragrance and he was still intact. In our own day, the miracles continue. He lived a life of almost constant prayer, and he practiced unbelievable austerities. He worked at hard and menial tasks without ever losing a moment of union with God. His charity, humility, and obedience were extraordinary. Pope John XIII raised Martin de Porres to the altar of the church on May 5th 1962. On January 28th, the Roman Catholic Church celebrates St. Thomas Aquinas, the 13th century theologian who showed the Catholic faith is in harmony with philosophy and all other branches of knowledge. The son of Landolf, Count of Aquino, St. Thomas Aquinas was born circa 1225 in Rocca Secca, Italy, near Aquino, Terra di Lavoro, in the Kingdom of Sicily. His mother, Theodora, was a Countess of Teano. Thomas's family members were descendants of Emperors Frederick I and Henry VI. Before St. Thomas Aquinas was born, a holy hermit shared a prediction with his mother, foretelling that her son would enter the order of friars preachers, become a great learner, and achieve unequaled sanctity. Thomas had eight siblings, and he was the youngest child. 
Following the tradition of the period, St. Thomas Aquinas was sent to the Abbey of Monte Cassino to train among Benedictine monks when he was just five years old. St. Thomas Aquinas remained at the monastery until he was 13 years old, when the political climate forced him to return to Naples. Thomas began his theological studies at the University of Naples in the fall of 1239. It is believed that Thomas was introduced to his philosophical influences, Aristotle, Averroes, and Maimonides at the university, where he also met John of St. Julian, a Dominican preacher who influenced him greatly. Thomas soon joined a new religious order known as the Order of Preachers, or the Dominicans, after their founder, St. Dominic de Guzman, an order which placed an emphasis on preaching and teaching. Thomas's parents were none too pleased with his decision to join this new evangelical movement. In order to talk some sense into him, Thomas's mother sent his brothers to bring him to the family. Having resisted his family's wishes, he was placed under house arrest. A famous story has it that one day his family members sent a prostitute into the room where Thomas was being held prisoner. But Thomas drove her off with a fire iron. As the door slammed shut behind her, he traced a black cross on the door. That night, two angels appeared to him in a dream and strengthened his resolve to remain celibate. Eventually, Thomas's mother relented and he returned to the Dominicans in the fall. Thomas went to study at the Faculty of the Arts at the University of Paris, where he is believed to have met Dominican scholar Albertus Mangus, the Chair of Theology, who was later canonized as a saint by the Church. Under the tutelage of St. Albert the Great, Thomas subsequently earned his doctorate in theology. Thomas was quiet and seldom spoke at the university, leading other students to believe he was dim-witted. They started calling him the Dumb Ox. After reading Thomas's thesis and thinking it was brilliant, his professor, St. Albert the Great, proclaimed, We call this young man a dumb ox but his bellowing in doctrine will one day resound throughout the world. By the time he was 23, Thomas was teaching alongside his mentor at the University of Cologne. After completing his education, St. Thomas Aquinas devoted himself to a life of traveling, writing, teaching, public speaking, and preaching. Around the middle of the century, Thomas was ordained to the priesthood in which he showed great reverence for the liturgy and skill as a homilist. Religious institutions and universities alike yearned to benefit from the wisdom of the Christian apostle. Combining traditional principles of theology with modern philosophic thought, Thomas's treatise touched upon the questions and struggles of medieval intellectuals, church authorities, and everyday people alike. Thomas believed that people could have both faith and reason and said that both kinds of knowledge came from God, so it was all right to have both. This theory is called scholasticism, and his work popularized this theory. He believed that people could prove that God existed in five ways, including understanding that cause and effect was all under God's control. All movement in the world came from God, and that human intelligence was a gift from God. He also believed that God was all-powerful, and that people could earn admission into heaven by abiding to moral and government laws. He had lots of followers and people who agreed with him, 
So he was very influential, both while he was alive and for centuries after his death. Thomas continued to teach and write till 1272, and it was during this time that he wrote his most famous works, Summa Theologi and De Virtutibus and De Eternitate Mundi. He later established the university in Naples and took the regent master post. In 1273, Thomas was seen by the sacristan to be crying and levitating in prayer before an icon of the crucified Christ at the Dominican convent of Naples in the chapel of St. Nicholas. During this prayer, Christ is said to have told him, You have written well of me, Thomas. What reward would you have for your labor? Thomas replied, Nothing but you, Lord. Following this exchange, something happened, but Thomas never wrote or spoke of it. Thomas refused to write any more. When begged to return to work, he replied, I cannot, because all that I have written seems like straw to me. In January 1274, St. Thomas Aquinas embarked on a trip to Lyon, France on foot to serve on the Second Council, but he never made it to his destination. Along the way, he fell ill at the Cistercian Monastery of Fossanova, Italy. The monks wanted St. Thomas Aquinas to stay at the castle, but sensing that his death was near, Thomas preferred to remain at the monastery, saying, if the Lord wishes to take me away, it is better that I be found in a religious house than in the dwelling of a layperson. Often called the universal teacher, St. Thomas Aquinas died at the monastery of Fossanova on March 7, 1274. His original feast day was March 7, the day of his death. But because the date often falls within Lent, in 1969, a revision of the Roman calendar changed his feast day to January 28th. St. Thomas's comments and philosophical writings are still debated today, and his aesthetic theories, such as the concept of claritas, deeply influenced the literary writings of James Joyce and Italian semiotician Umberto Eco. St. Thomas is often depicted with an open book or writing with a quill. St. John of the Cross was a mystic, poet, saint, and doctor of the church. He was born in a small town called Fontiveros in Spain. John's father, Gonzalo de Yepes, who belonged to a wealthy family of silk merchants in Toledo, had married Catalina Alvarez, a weaver of poor and humble background shocked and disturbed by what they considered shameful, a marriage to a girl of low position. The merchant family disinherited Gonzalo. Deprived of his financial security, he had to adapt to the drudgery of the poor, which in his case meant the lowly trade of weaving. The couple had three sons, Francisco, Luis, and the youngest, Juan who would be later known as St. John of the Cross. John was a little more than two years old when his father died. His older brother, Luis, died two years after that, likely because of malnutrition. Catalina, along with little John, left their home and reached Medina del Campo, the bustling market center of Castile. When she received a job offer in a weaving position, she wasted no time in saying yes. Catalina was described as a devout Christian who brought up her sons with the greatest Christian spirit and encouraged them to be devoted to the Mother of God. 
John was enrolled in a school for poor children where he received an elementary education. The school resembled an orphanage where the children received food, clothing, and lodging. John was given a religious education from a young age, and he chose to follow a religious path even as a child. He served as an acolyte at an Augustinian monastery. In his spare time, he worked in a hospital and developed a great love for the poor and the sick. He sometimes felt that he was in the presence of Jesus when he was tending the patients. At age 17, the bright young lad enrolled at the Jesuit school, where lectures in grammar, rhetoric, Latin, and Greek were the rule. These years of hospital work and study, tasks that called for responsibility and diligence, complemented John's early experiences of poverty. In 1563, at age 21, John entered the Carmelite novitiate, recently founded in Medina. John probably took this decision as he was inspired by the contemplative spirit and its devotion to Mary, the Mother of God. That same year, he received the habit of the order and the religious name, John of St. Matthias. He completed further studies at Salamanca and in 1567 was ordained to the priesthood. Shortly after ordination, the young friar returned to Medina del Campo, where he met the great Carmelite reformer, Teresa of Avila. They were years apart in age when they first met. Teresa was beginning the foundation of her second reformed Carmel at the age of 52, and John was a newly ordained priest who had just turned 25. At the time of their first conversation, John was considering leaving the Carmelite order for a more prayerful and secluded life as a Carthusian monk, and Teresa had begun her reform to establish houses closer to the original spirit of Carmel. Having permission to also erect a reformed priory, she needed a male counterpart to begin the foundation. John was attracted by the strict routine followed by Teresa, a routine she hoped to reintroduce to her order, as well as her devotion to prayer and simplicity. Her followers went barefoot, and were therefore known as the Discalced Carmelites. On November 28, 1568, Teresa founded a new monastery. The same day, John changed his name again to John of the Cross. Within a couple years, John and his fellow friars relocated to a larger site for their monastery. He remained at this location until 1572. The reforms of Teresa and John, however, led to tensions among the Spanish Carmelite friars. John and Teresa suffered much for the reform of Carmel. John was abducted from his dwelling in Avila by a group who opposed the reforms. He was made a prisoner in a Carmelite monastery in Toledo. At that time, the order's most important monastery in Castile. He was kept under brutal conditions and subjected to routine physical torture. He was kept isolated in a tiny stifling cell measuring 10 feet by 6 feet. He was publicly lashed before the community weekly, fed a very poor diet, and not even given a change of clothes. His physical health suffered greatly. He kept himself open to God's action, for no prison could separate him from God's all-embracing love. During this time, he had many beautiful experiences and encounters with God in prayer. When the time ordained by God came, he escaped and made his way to a monastery of reformed Carmelite nuns in Toledo. They barely recognized him, for they found him emaciated, 
confused, and looking barely alive. St. John's experience in imprisonment brought with it a purification of the purest quality. It produced the most beautiful poetry Spain ever had, the spiritual canticle. After escaping, John spent eight months recuperating and writing Ascent of Mount Carmel, the prose commentaries on his poetry that explained the mystic way. In 1579, he became the rector of a new college, the Colegio de San Basilio, to support the studies of discalced friars in Andalusia. Continuing the reform even after Teresa's death, he established a monastery of discalced nuns in Malaga in 1585. The same year, he was elected provincial vicar of Andalusia. During the last few years of his life, John traveled and established new houses across Spain. The work of St. John consists of poetry and the mystical commentaries that he wrote on some of his poems. Best known are the spiritual canticle, the living flame of love, the dark night of the soul, and ascent of Mount Carmel. The last two works comment on the same poem. When he became ill, he chose to go to the city of Ubeda, where no one knew him. He died in Ubeda on December 14, 1591. Even though John died long ago in 1591, his spiritual writings and poetry are still read today by people who want to grow in their relationship with the Lord. One of John's most famous sayings is, in the evening of life, we will be judged on love alone. He was canonized in 1726 and was declared a doctor of the church in 1926. Oh, blessed Jesus, grant me stillness of soul in thee. Let thy mighty calmness reign in me. Rule me, O oh, thou king of gentleness, king of peace. Give me control control over my words, thoughts, and actions, from all irritability, want of meekness, want of gentleness. O oh, dear Lord, deliver me. By thine own deep patience, give me patience. St. Gregory the Great, a central figure of the medieval Western Church and one of the most admired popes in history. St. Gregory, born in Rome about the year 540, was the son of Gordianus, a wealthy senator. Gregory was descended from Roman nobles with a strong legacy of Christian faith. He was related to two previous popes, Felix III and Agapetus I. Gregory's mother, Sylvia, left him to enter a small oratory near St. Paul's in Rome, where she led a life of such austerity and holiness. She was canonized by the church after her death. His aunts were nuns, and his parents joined cloisters in their later years. Like most of the upper class of his time, he was well-educated. But unlike many, he was generous and concerned about the poor. Gregory lived in Rome during a period of wars, invasions by hostile tribes, famine, and destruction. Rome was under siege by one barbarian conqueror after another. Within a period of less than 20 years, the suffering city was taken and retaken six times. The Lombards laid waste the cities, despoiled the towns and villages, burned the churches, tore down the monasteries, desolated the farms. Gregory received a classical education in liberal arts and the law. It is not surprising, therefore, with these sad memories never far from his mind, 
that he accepted the post of Prefecture of Rome, the highest civil dignity in the city. He believed he could protect his people, like his ancestors before him. He was around 30 years old by now. He was responsible for finances, police, provisioning, and public works, an experience that helped him hone his administrative skills. The people came eventually to know and to love him and to depend on him for their safety. Yet, Gregory remained dissatisfied. Sometime after working in the imperial capital, Gregory chose to leave the civil administration to become a monk during the rise of the Benedictine order. Upon his father's death in 574, he converted his house into a monastery and retired to a life of contemplation and prayer. During these years, the happiest in Gregory's life, he began a detailed study of the scriptures. He also founded six Benedictine monasteries on his estates in Sicily. He also turned over the remainder of his fortune for the care of the poor. But it soon became clear after his third year at St. Andrews that days of quiet prayer and work were not to be Gregory's portion for much longer. In 578, quite against his will, Pope Benedict I made him one of the seven deacons of Rome. Now began his works, which earned him the title of being the Great. From Rome, he was sent to Constantinople to seek aid from the emperor for Rome's civic troubles and to aid in resolving the Eastern Church's theological controversies. When he arrived back in Rome, he was made the abbot of St. Andrews. He found Rome again beset with calamities. Floods and tempests battered it, and earthquakes rocked it. He was saddened to see that the evil had found its way into the monastery as well. One of the monks confessed as he lay dying that he had concealed in his bed three gold coins. This violation so shocked Gregory that he decided to punish the erring monk in such a way that the rest of the monastery would not forget. Gregory ordered the monk to be left to die alone. Gregory ordered his body thrown on a dung heap along with the three coins. Then, later, in a change of heart, Gregory offered 30 masses for the deceased monk. On the 30th day, Brother Justice appeared to one of his brothers and told him that he was delivered from purgatory. The joy of the chastened monastery knew no bounds. And God was so pleased with the discipline and charity of his servant Gregory that we find the story preserved down to our own time. The well-known Gregorian Masses, said on 30 consecutive days for the repose of the souls of the loved ones for whom we continue to this day to request them. In 590, Pope Pelagius II died, and Gregory was proclaimed Pope by acclamation. This was not something Gregory wanted, but he accepted the burden nonetheless. Unwillingly, Gregory accepted the role. He was the first Pope to call himself the Servant of the Servants of God. Gregory made clear he preferred the monastic life in a series of writings praising it. He emphasized the aspect of service to the poor for deacons. They were often tasked with giving alms to the poor, and at least one was assigned to each church and ordained for this purpose. Pope Gregory may have also established Cantus Planus, 
known in English as plain chant. Most today know this style of singing as Gregorian chant. The melodious, monophonic music is known throughout the church and closely associated with medieval monasteries. Gregorian chant gives us the oldest music we still have in the original form, some dating to the centuries just after the death of Gregory. It remains a matter of some dispute just how involved Pope Gregory was in the development of the style. Gregory was well known for his alms to the poor, and he gave quite generously of the riches donated to the church by the wealthy people of Rome. Everything from money to land was given to the poor in some fashion. He made clear to his subordinates that their duty was to relieve the distress faced by the poor. Any clergy who were unwilling to go into the streets and help the poor were replaced. Assets of the church were liquidated to provide income for alms. When a famine struck Rome in the 590s, Pope Gregory ordered the church to use its assets to feed the poor. Gregory himself refused to eat until his monks returned from their work of handing out food. He also made certain to dine with a dozen poor people at each meal. A deadly form of plague also started spreading in the streets of Rome. The corpses of the dead piled up in the streets. The dreaded disease always ended in a spasm of sneezing or yawning, and the Holy Pontiff ordered that God bless you should be said to those who sneeze. And the making of the sign of the cross on the mouths of those who yawn goes back to the days of St. Gregory and the Roman plague. In 593, St. Gregory wrote the four books of dialogues, which, together with the pastoral rule, were the two works most universally read and prized throughout the Middle Ages. The dialogues provide an excellent history of the times. Pope Gregory I combined pastoral leadership and prayer with personal holiness and social service but his later years were troubled with poor health. He died on March 12, 604. He was canonized immediately after his death by the unanimous acclaim of his people. What really made Pope Gregory great? His achievements were many and had a widespread effect, but Gregory became a saint because of his love for God which was reflected in all that he did. We celebrate St. Gregory the Great's feast day on September 3rd. He is the patron saint of musicians, singers, students, and teachers. Have you ever been asked to do something you weren't sure you could do? This happened to St. Ambrose. In the year 374, a meeting was called by the people to elect the new bishop of Milan. Ambrose, who was the governor, attended the election for two reasons. He knew there might be disagreements and felt responsible for keeping the peace. Since Ambrose was preparing for baptism, he was also interested in who would be bishop. During the election, fighting broke out. No one could agree on who the bishop should be. Ambrose stood and pleaded for peace in the assembly. During his speech, a voice cried out, Ambrose for bishop. Ambrose was shocked. The crowd took up the cry, shouting, Ambrose for bishop. Ambrose begged them not to elect him, but he could not silence them. Over the next several months, 
Ambrose was baptized, ordained, and consecrated bishop. Saint Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, was born in the year 340 into the family of the Roman prefect of Gaul, now France. He was the third child in the family, a sister, Marcelina, and a brother, Satyrus, having been born before him. There was a story when he was a child. He was being taken care of by a nurse at the time. One day when the nurse arrived, she was surprised to see a swarm of bees swoop down and rest upon his eyes and lips of the sleeping child. Frightened, she called to some of the members of the household. They came and Ambrose's father and mother saw the bees enter and leave the mouth of the child without disturbing him. The bees then flew off and were lost in the blazing sun. Ambrose's father exclaimed, This child is destined for great things. This story of Ambrose symbolizes the future eloquence as the Bishop of Milan and his deeds in the leading of the sheepfold of the church. His father wanted Ambrose to have an administrative career. He was sent to the best school in Rome to study philosophy, theology, and literature. About the year 370, upon completion of his course of study, Ambrose was appointed to the position of governor of the districts of Liguria and Emilia. He continued in this position for three years, and he was soon well respected in the community. In the year 374, Auxentius, the Arian bishop of Mediolanum, died. This led to complications between the Orthodox and the Arians since each side wanted to have its own bishop. Ambrose, as the chief city official, went to the church to resolve the dispute. While he was speaking to the crowd, suddenly someone cried out, Ambrose for bishop! The people took up this chant. Ambrose, who at this time was still a catechumen, considered himself unworthy and tried to refuse. He disparaged himself and even tried to flee from the gathering. The matter went ultimately before the emperor Valentinian the Elder, whose orders Ambrose dared not disobey. He gave up all of his worldly belongings, agreed to be baptized and ordained, and devoted his talents to the service of the church. Ambrose's asceticism and generosity increased his popularity. During his time as bishop, he experienced many fierce, bitter struggles in his efforts to eradicate the heresy of Arianism, which denied the divinity of Christ. Saint Ambrose came late to the study of theology, but his scholarly training enabled him to master it quickly. He used all of this while preaching. His abilities impressed Augustine of Hippo, who previously thought poorly of Christian preachers. After meeting Ambrose, Augustine re-evaluated himself and was forever changed. In 387, Ambrose baptized Augustine, who he had a great influence on. Saint Monica, Augustine's mother, loved Ambrose as an angel of God who uprooted her son from his former ways and led him to his convictions of Christ. Ambrose had many churches built and enriched them with relics. He preached and instructed with wonderful eloquence. The poor, the imprisoned, widows, orphans, and the unfortunate won his time and attention. The pen of Ambrose was as eloquent as his tongue. His writings are voluminous, 
and those regarding religious doctrine are still constantly quoted and appealed to as proof of Christian teaching. Ambrose's career as bishop had three important aspects. The quality of his thought as a Christian intellectual. His role in the final phase of the Arian controversy. And his impact upon the relations between church and empire. Ambrose was an advocate of simplicity. He gave a share of his family's money to the poor and encouraged others to do so. He took a firm stance in controversial matters of church and state. When conflicts arose with the ruling family, Ambrose told the people, the emperor is in the church, not above it. On more than one occasion, Empress Justina sent soldiers to force Ambrose to go along with her wishes. Ambrose had to defend his cathedral against attack, but the people stood by their bishop and the army had to back down. Later, Emperor Theodosius, to get revenge for the murder of several officers, had a town of 7,000 people destroyed. Ambrose warned Theodosius that he would be excommunicated if he did not do public penance. People were astounded that Ambrose would do this. Later, they were speechless when Theodosius knelt at Ambrose's feet, humbly accepting forgiveness. Theodosius reconciled himself with the church and the bishop, who attended to the emperor on his deathbed. The fame of Bishop Ambrose and his actions attracted to him many followers from other lands. From far away Persia, learned men came to him to ask him questions and absorb his wisdom. The saint combined strictness with an uncommon kindliness. Granted a gift of wonder-working, he healed many from sickness. One time at Florence, while staying at the house of Decentus, he resurrected a dead boy. Ambrose was generous to the poor. He considered them not a group of outsiders, but rather those of the united people. To him, giving to the poor was just a repayment of God's resources, which were intended for everyone equally. Ambrose is credited with advising Augustine of Hippo to follow local liturgical customs. When I am at Rome, I fast on a Saturday. When I am at Milan, I do not. Follow the custom of the church where you are, he stated. This advice remains today and is translated in English as the saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Ambrose led an active life and died at age 57 in 397. Saint Ambrose of Milan was known for being a doctor of the church. Ambrose was the first to formulate ideas about church-state relations, which would become the prevalent medieval Christian viewpoint on the matter. His writings remained an important point of reference for the church well into the medieval era and beyond. Saint Ambrose has been named one of the Holy Fathers of the church, whose teaching all bishops should in every way follow. O oh God, you give blessed Ambrose to your people as a minister of eternal salvation. Grant, we pray you, that as on earth he was a teacher of supernatural life, so we may deserve to have him as our intercessor in heaven. Amen. The name of Charles Borromeo is associated with reform. He lived during the time of the Protestant Reformation 
and had a hand in the reform of the whole church during the final years of the Council of Trent. Saint Charles Borromeo was born on October 2nd, 1538, at the castle of Arona on Lake Maggiore near Milan. Many sources recount that the birth of the saint was announced by a brilliant light that appeared above the castle, illuminating the night from two in the morning, the time of his birth until daybreak. His father was the Count of Arona and his mother a member of the House of Medici. He was the second son of distinguished and wealthy parents who raised him in an extremely religious atmosphere. When he was 12, he was given tonsure, which is the cutting of hair on top of the head. This marked him for the priesthood, and he was educated with that goal in mind. Young Charles suffered from a speech impediment that made him appear slow to those who did not know him. Despite this challenge, he performed well and impressed his teachers. Charles, even as a very little boy, was very careful that in his dress and his conduct, there should not be the slightest thing unbecoming in one who hoped to consecrate himself to the special service of God. In 1554, his father passed away and although Charles was a teenager, the responsibility of his household fell on him. Yet, he studied hard to receive a doctorate in civil and canon law from the University of Pavia in 1559. Life sped up for Charles when his uncle, Pope Pius IV, took him to Rome and appointed him as Cardinal Deacon. The young Borromeo used his leadership role in the Vatican to promote learning, and he established a literary academy. In 1560, at the age of 22, Charles was appointed administrator of the Archdiocese of Milan. He was assigned to an important role, and many dignitaries came to meet him. Yet, he only thought of the work he could do for God and the church, remaining as humble and free as if he had been poor and unknown. Charles had already developed a reputation as a young, idealistic reformer in Rome, and he continued that mission in Milan. He established hospitals, orphanages, and other charitable institutions. Borromeo nevertheless had the support of many religious congregations, including his own Oblates of St. Ambrose. As Archbishop, Charles embarked on some important reforms within the church. He shut down corrupt monastic orders. This led to a failed assassination attempt twice on his life later. He demanded that priests should take pastoral care of those entrusted to them. He saw that many of the clergy at that time were ignorant, and so he founded schools, colleges, and seminaries for clergy to be educated in the truth of the church. In 1562, his brother died, and his family urged him to leave the service of the church to preserve the family name. However, Borromeo refused. He became more insistent upon becoming a good bishop. Charles is a saint for our time because of his actions during the pandemic in Milan in the 1570s. In a pandemic not too dissimilar to the one we are facing now, Charles led his priests to care for the people of Milan. When the city officials ran away from danger, Charles ran towards it. He prepared himself for death, wrote his will, and went to the hospitals where cases were worst. In today's terms, 
St. Charles was most certainly a key worker. As a priest, he administered the sacraments to those who were dying. He gave the Eucharist to plague victims through their open windows. There's even a story of him climbing a mount of dead bodies to give the sacrament of the sick to a man dying at the top. He was a great reformer, and he spared no one, including himself, while imposing the strictest discipline for the order. The church had fallen into days of corruption, dishonesty, and immorality. This naturally raised up against him an army of enemies, and they teamed up together against the bishop. Soon, an assassin was hired to kill him. Late on a November afternoon, Charles was celebrating the evening service in his own chapel. He was on his knees at the altar. Behind him, the people were atoning in anthem and the assassin fired multiple shots at the bishop. Somehow, none of the shots harmed him, and they were deflected. Only one managed to graze him slightly. It could only have been the wings of the angels which caused this miracle. When the people around him rushed to the assistance of their beloved father, he ordered them to their knees again, and with unshaken calm, he proceeded with the service. Charles forbade himself all luxury, reduced his household staff, forbade his retainers to accept any presents, and sold all of his property to help feed the poor. There was not a town or village to which he did not go. Everywhere he renewed the churches, preached, gave instructions, administered the holy sacraments, and exhorted all to lead a Christian life. Work and the heavy burdens of his high office began to affect Archbishop Borromeo's health. He fasted almost daily and in the last years of his life, just on water and bread. During the 40 days fast, he even abstained from bread. Toward the end of October in the year 1584, Charles had been traveling to some outlying districts in the diocese. On the way home, he fell ill with a heavy fever and had to be brought back to Milan on a stretcher. When he became obvious that he would die, he was given his last sacraments. He died on November 3rd at the age of 46, 26 years after his death in 1610. He was canonized by Pope Paul V and is the patron saint of catechists. Saint Charles Borromeo has a beautiful shrine in the Milan Cathedral and is often depicted in art wearing his robes, barefoot, carrying the cross with a rope around his neck and his arm raised in blessing. St. Charles Borromeo saw Christ in his neighbor and knew that charity done for the least of his flock was charity done for Christ. His winning gentleness, his deep humility, and his perfection in other virtues he, however, closed early a life so fruitful in good and great deeds. One of the first deacons of the church was a man named Stephen, a man filled with the Holy Spirit and with faith. Stephen was a relative of St. Paul. He was the first of seven deacons whom the holy apostles ordained for the service of the poor in Jerusalem. This is why he is called the archdeacon, the first or chief of them. 
Stephen did many things for the poor and widows in Jerusalem, and by the power of his faith, he worked many miracles. He lived his life to be an example to everyone who saw him of how Jesus came to serve and not be served. Not much is known about St. Stephen's origin. In the beginning of the church, its members were Jews. Many of these Jews lived in Palestine, but others lived in distant cities around the Mediterranean Sea. We call them Hellenized Jews. As adults, many of them came to Jerusalem to live. Among these Hellenized Jews was Stephen. Hearing the preaching of the apostles in Jerusalem, he came to believe in Christ Jesus. He is first mentioned in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, when the apostles appoint seven deacons in order to minister to the physical needs of the faithful. As the first and the oldest of the seven ordained deacons, Stephen was given the title of archdeacon. His work was marked by diligence and caring from the beginning. And soon he made time to engage in more than the distribution of food and aid to the widows. He became engrossed in the ministry of Christ's Word. In the beginning, Stephen started his ministry among the Greek-speaking Jews, some of whom were not open to the gospel of Christ. Stephen is described in Acts as full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and his talents for preaching were so great that those Jews were irritated. Such preaching as this, that men who were not Jews might be saved by believing in Christ, made many of the Jews very angry. Stephen did many things for the poor and widows in Jerusalem, and by the power of his faith, he worked many miracles. The Jewish authorities argued with him, but were always beaten by his wisdom and the power of the Spirit who acted through him. Unable to combat Stephen's preaching, his opponents found men who were willing to lie about what St. Stephen taught to claim that they heard him speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. Stephen's opponents produced witnesses who claimed that we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the traditions which Moses delivered unto us. Are these things so? asked the high priest. And as Stephen stood up to answer the high priest, all fixed their eyes upon him, and they saw that his face was shining as though it was the face of an angel. Then Stephen began to speak of the great things that God had done for his people in the past, how he had called Abraham, their father, to go forth into a new land how he had given them great men as Joseph and Moses and the prophets. He showed them how the Israelites had not been faithful to God, who had given them such wonderful blessings. Then Stephen said, You are a people with hard hearts and stiff necks who will not obey the word of God and his spirit. As your fathers did, so you do also. Your fathers killed the prophets whom God sent to them, and you have slain Jesus, the righteous one. As they heard these things, they became so angry against Stephen that they gnashed on him with their teeth like wild beasts. As Stephen concluded his defense, he looked up, and saw a vision of Jesus standing at the right hand of God.
He said, Look, I can see heaven thrown open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. For them, Jesus could not possibly be beside the Father in heaven. The crowd rushed upon Stephen and carried him outside of the city. At this time, Jewish law permitted the death penalty by stoning for blasphemy. Stephen full of grace and fortitude to the very end, met the great test without flinching, praying the Lord to receive his spirit and not to lay this sin against the people. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, lay not this sin up against them, he prayed. And when he had said this, he fell asleep in death, the first to be slain for the gospel of Christ. Even in his final moments, St. Stephen displayed a forgiving spirit and even asking God not to hold the sin of his attackers against them. Among his murderers was his relative Saul, or Paul, who later became an apostle. This all occurred exactly one year after the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, which we celebrate on Pentecost. Stephen died as Jesus did, falsely accused, brought to unjust condemnation because he spoke the truth fearlessly. He died with his eyes trustfully fixed on God and with a prayer of forgiveness on his lips. St. Stephen's body was taken secretly and buried by Gamaliel on his own land, but the location of his tomb was not specified. It was only in 415 AD that a priest named Lucian had a dream that revealed the sight of St. Stephen's remains. St. Stephen is often depicted with stones, a gospel book, a miniature church, and a martyr's palm frond. Lord Jesus, you chose Stephen as the first deacon and martyr of your one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. The heroic witness of his holy life and death reveals your continued presence among us through following the example of his living faith and by his intercession. Empower us by your Holy Spirit to live as witnesses to the faith in this new missionary age. No matter what our state in life, career, or vocation, help us to proclaim in both word and in deed, the fullness of the gospel to a world which is waiting to be born anew in Jesus Christ. Pour out upon your whole church the same Holy Spirit which animated St. Stephen, martyr, to be faithful to the end, which is a beginning of life eternal in the communion of the Trinity. Did you know that it was St. Boniface who started the use of the Christmas tree to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ? That day, St. Boniface was preaching in a small village near Hesse. People were attracted by Christianity, but unable to give up their old religion and superstitions, perhaps out of fear of how their old gods would react. These gods were special. They demanded human sacrifices from time to time, 
in a winter ritual that took place under the thunder oak tree, the pagans would often sacrifice a child. It was during one such ritual in the winter of 722, St. Boniface came to the site of the sacrifice with a gospel message that shocked the pagans. To show the people how powerless their gods were, Boniface began to cut down the tree, calling on Thor to strike him down if this was really his holy tree. At the moment the axe touched the tree, there was a strong wind. In one hit, the tree fell down. The villagers were astounded. The holy bishop preached the gospel to the people and used a little fir tree that was behind the now felled oak tree as a tool of evangelization. Pointing to it, he said, This little tree, a young child of the forest, shall be your holy tree tonight. It is the wood of peace. It is the sign of an endless life for its leaves are evergreen. See how it points upward to heaven. Let this be called the tree of the Christ child. Gather about it, not in the wild woods, but in your own homes. Here it will shelter no deeds of blood, but loving gifts and rites of kindness. God does not want sacrifice and violence. God wants peace. The people were very surprised. This was a miracle. Never again did they capture and sacrifice people. Saint Boniface was very bold in his faith, and he was well known for being very good at using the local customs and culture of the day to bring people to Christ. Born around 675 CE in Wessex, part of present-day Devon, England, St. Boniface was originally named Winfred. Born into a noble family, he convinced them to send him to school at Benedictine monasteries. He received a first-rate education at the monastery. As a result, Winfred decided to become a Benedictine monk. He was ordained as a priest around the age of 30. He was the head of a school and a brilliant teacher. He wrote a book on grammar, which was used by children for hundreds of years. But ever since he was young, he had wanted to be a missionary, to travel and tell people about the one true God. He became a missionary in his 40s, and left his relatively comfortable and safe life in England to travel to mainland Europe. In 716, he joined another missionary, Willibrord, to try and convert the pagan tribes. In the three years he spent with Willibrord, Boniface gave as much as he gained. So helpful was he that Willibrord, who was in his 60s, wanted to make Boniface his successor. While he'd been away, his abbot had died, and Winfrith had been elected to replace him. It was a high honor, but Winfrith still wanted to be a missionary. Pope Gregory II confirmed Winfrith's call to missions, remarking, You seem to glow with the salvation bringing fire which our Lord came to send upon the earth. The Pope changed Winfrith's name to Boniface, which meant good works. He spent the rest of his life evangelizing the areas of modern Germany and parts of the Netherlands. Boniface invited monks and sisters from England to come and help him. Nuns and monks responded to his call enthusiastically for many years. While establishing churches and Benedictine monasteries, he baptized heathens and opposed ambitious and free-living clerics. His zeal against heresy 
often led to ruthless, severe action. He demanded that two heretical missionaries not only be excommunicated, but imprisoned in solitary confinement. He has a reputation as difficult, prickly, and tactless. He was equally zealous in his mission against paganism. As said at the beginning of this episode, at a village near Hess, he found a huge sacred tree which the people worshipped as Thunder Oak Tree. They used to sacrifice little children here. He immediately took an axe to it. After only a few blows, the tree toppled to the ground. The Germans were astounded. The holy bishop preached the gospel to the people and used a little fir tree that was behind the now felled oak tree as a tool of evangelization. Awed by the destruction of the oak tree and Boniface's preaching, the Germans were baptized. Never again did they capture and sacrifice people. In December, the people decorated a fir tree. They gathered under the tree, greeting one another. They gave gifts. They celebrated peace. Probably because of this, tradition has credited Boniface with inventing the Christmas tree. Boniface went to Rome again in 732, and the next pope, Gregory III, made him an archbishop, giving him Bavaria as a new mission territory. After his success in Hesse, Boniface went to Thuringia, staying there from 725 to 735 and setting up more churches. In 741, through one of his disciples, Sturm, he founded the famous Abbey of Fulda. This later became and is still today a meeting place for the German bishops. Few saints retire and Boniface was no exception. Even when he was old, he wanted to keep on being a missionary. He especially wanted to tell the story of Jesus to the people in North Holland. As an old man, Boniface returned to Frisia to work among the pagans. One morning, while he was waiting to confirm a group of converts, a band of angry natives rushed into the church and murdered Boniface and about 50 converts. Boniface's body was later taken to Fulda. Boniface is known as the Apostle of Germany. He not only brought the Christian faith, but Roman Christian civilization to this portion of Europe. O oh God, through the zeal of your martyr and bishop, blessed Boniface, you brought a great multitude of peoples to the knowledge of your name. Grant that we may enjoy the protection of him whose feast we celebrate. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.